Hey everybody and welcome to another Chairman of the Board ranking video. In this series I take a look at the last 10 new to me board games that I've played and I rank them from my least favourite up to my most favourite. Now before I get started on the 10 games I want to give a shout out to the show's sponsor keyender.co.uk who are my go-to online retailer and if you use the link in the show notes or the QR code then you can get 5% off your first order. Okay, so at number 10, I have Number Drop. Now, this is a roll and write style Tetris game as you are rolling dice, which are going to give you numbers on them. And then you're going to put them in Tetris shapes and then dropping them to the bottom of your player sheet, trying to create patterns and rows. Now, you know, there's a lot of games like this out there. I found this one a little bit clunky and a little bit fiddly in terms of the way that you are mapping out these patterns, because I think you want same numbers um, kind of chaining together, you want kind of um, consecutive numbers chaining together, and the way that those scoring things work are a little bit weird. Um, I also thought some of the graphic design on some of the cards was a bit annoying because um, despite you playing in 2D, the actual artwork was 3D, and it just kind of um, created a little bit of jarring in terms of um, just translating those cards over and the shapes that you can build. But other than that, it's completely pedestrian, standardized stuff that we've seen time and time again. And ultimately, it didn't really inspire me. So hence why Number Drop was at number 10. At number 9, I have Nautilus Island. Now, this is a simple set collection style game with an almost time track style mechanism where you're jumping back and forth on this ship, collecting cards uh, as you go. Kind of the further you go along, the more options you have and the more cards you can collect but you'll go last next time. And there is this kind of tension into cashing these cards in for points um, to get additional bonuses, but you can lock yourself out of scoring different categories um, as well. So again, a kind of a mishmash of different set collection games that we've seen before. It works pretty well and I did enjoy it. It's very snappy, it's quick. You know, you're looking at around 15 minutes to play this one. I think the biggest death knell on this one is the fact that it take, takes quite a lot to set up the game. There's a lot of cards in the game, lots of shuffling, lots of different piles and things. And ultimately that kind of hurts it because the effort you take to you know, pack up and set up the game isn't quite proportionate to how long the game takes. So gameplay was fine and it has some little quirks that I enjoyed, but I don't think it was quite worth the setup because it was just a little bit too cumbersome. At number eight, I have Isla or Isla. Uh, this is an upcoming Kickstarter game that I think is actually, um, should be on Kickstarter at the moment actually. Uh, this one is another roll and write style game where you are trying to explore uh, this island as much as you can. Now the actual system of the game is, is super cool and I, I think it's quite a novel idea where you have a bunch of different dice. So you've got like your, your D4s up to your D12s you're rolling them, you're selecting which one you want to use, which will show how many squares you can move orthogonally on this map. However, when you use a certain die, that die is going to be exhausted until you hit this kind of refresh point to let you use it uh, again. Um, other than that, you are trying to again, cover each square as much as you can because each unexplored square is going to be negative points. Uh, you're trying to collect these little tokens and cash them in against these contracts. Um, and that's pretty much the gist um, of the game, you know, another 15 minute game or so. Um, it's pretty smooth. I think it could have been smoother in terms of having a bit more of a uniform turn structure, which I have covered in my review. Um, so you know, all in all, it's it's a decent roll and write game. I don't think it's terribly inspiring again, uh, but it does what it does quite well. And I think it, that core system of that dice refresh mechanism has a ton of potential. And I think the design team should really focus on building a game around that. So check out my review and of course, check out the Kickstarter campaign if this one appeals to you. At number seven, I have Hooky. Now this is a competitive deduction word game where you are trying to work out uh, the letters that other players have behind their screens, as well as trying to work out three Hooky letters which are not in the mix. Uh, at all and you're going to be asking questions to your opponents in like a, a wordle like fashion where you'll provide a five letter word they'll tell you how many letters they have behind their screen that are within uh, that word and of course you're going to try and work out which letters they have 
And what I like about this game is the fact that you can backtrack or kind of retrofit those letters that you've asked on previous questions as you get more of the puzzle uh, together. It's a very satisfying, fun and engaging kind of practice, uh, I suppose. Now, I really do enjoy that deduction part of the game. I think it's very enjoyable. But the issue I have with this game is some of the, the sweetness of the scoring. Because you actually score one point for each letter you guess correctly that other players have. Um, but you score quite a large sum of points if you guess those hooky letters correctly. And sometimes that can be down to pure luck because you might have narrowed down those hooky letters to say seven letters. It could be three of those seven letters. Um, your opponent does the same thing. They take a pure shot in the dark and guess three of them correctly. You guess them all incorrectly, therefore they've won through no better deduction than what you've done. So and I didn't quite like the way that that worked in terms of the points distribution, but the actual deduction part and the gameplay is super enjoyable and it would have ranked higher if that was the bigger focus of the game in terms of scoring, because it's the enjoyable part of the game and what the game's all about, but it's not what really rewards you as much as it could have done. Um, so yeah, I like this one. It could have ranked higher if it wasn't for that reason, but as an activity rather than the actual gamey side of it, it's a fantastic um, experience. So that is a hooky at number seven. At number six, I have Gin. So back to a traditional style uh, Euro here. This is quite a simple one where you are navigating this map, um, triggering actions, collecting different resources, and essentially trying to battle these gins and capture them in bottles. Now I have reviewed this one and kind of the main talking points that I mentioned were that there's no real distinct mechanism um, about it. It really is just a mishmash of collecting different things. Um, and I also thought it lacked a certain kind of longevity or a reason to come back to this one. But I did enjoy it. I think it's, um, it's, it's a good process. No, it's a nice clean, um, it's clean mechanically some good player interaction. Um, I like that tangible goal of trying to collect the gins and bottle them up um, as efficiently as you can. It really is that kind of optimization puzzle. Um, but I don't think it had enough meat on the bones um, to really be a, a code that you have to crack or something that's going to really rack your brains to be good at this one. I, I feel like after a, a couple of plays, I felt like I've kind of seen everything and that playing optimally isn't terribly difficult for me because I've played so many different Euro games. But as a, a first stop shop in terms of Euro games, if this is the, you know, if you're just dipping your toe into the Euro genre, this is a good option, which I think is similar to the designer's previous game, Crown of Amara. So I think this one's going to have its audience if you can kind of dabble with Euro games, but Euro games aren't your main focus because I think you've kind of seen everything here and you're going to suss everything out pretty quickly. At number five, I have The Duke. Now this is a pure abstract strategy style game that works a bit like chess. However, the movements of each of these pieces are actually on the pieces uh, themselves. And each time you move on your pieces, they're gonna to flip to the reverse side and it's gonna move differently from there. So you've got actions such as simply navigate around the board. You can attack at range, you can slide across the board. And it's all about just trying to capture or kill your opponent's um, Duke. Mechanically, it could not be more simple. Just add a new unit randomly on the board or move one of your existing um, units. But because of the way that the board becomes quite congested, just keep on spamming units onto the board isn't actually always a good idea. And you need to know when to strike and when to um, you know, take that um, aggressive side out on your opponent. Now, again, such a clean and pure design that I was very impressed by. Now, again, the only reason this probably didn't rank higher was because I found it quite difficult to track what each of the units do, because whenever you get use a unit, it flips to the reverse side, which means it will move differently. And those differences can be quite dramatic. And keeping track of that is so difficult, especially when you're starting out with the game. So I think this is going to be one that's going to reward repeated plays with the same person or to have a really good player aid with you so that you can again, see clearly what everything can do. Because with a game like this, you do not want to be making mistakes and it's so easy to do when you do not know what everything can do when you, you have the potential to know everything, but you've got to do the um, housekeeping yourself rather than the game doing it for you. So again, I think this is gonna be a grower. I think it's definitely gonna be a grower for sure. 
But right now, the learning curve is quite steep. And, you know, I, I get quite competitive with games like this, so I don't want to make those silly mistakes based on me not knowing what the information on the board is um, and taking too long to figure all that out. So that is the Duke at number five. At number four, I have Planet Unknown. So I've been really spoiled for good uh, polyomino style games recently. I played games such as World Wonders, games such as Wild Tile West. This one, I think, is just as good as those ones. This is um, a game where you're trying to fill up your planet with these polyomino tiles, of course. Um, however, the difference with this one is that when you place different tiles, then you're going to go up these corresponding tracks, get kind of new technologies and more points. And it even has that Keltis style mechanism where when you reach certain checkpoints, you can nudge up other things as well, which can create these kind of um, little kind of domino effect by keeping nudging all your different things up. Uh, these tracks. You have shared objectives with your neighbours. Um, each of the player sheets are unique and have different rules and restrictions and it all is based on this drafting mechanism where when you're when the active player chooses a tile you will rotate this kind of lazy Susan um, device around and everybody else will get to choose a tile relating to what's pointing towards them. So you're always engaged with this game which I thought was a you know massively to the game's credit so very little downtime. So this one, I can't really pick too many faults with it other than there might be, I think I slightly prefer Wild Hard West, but this one isn't too far behind. And um, yeah, even being a, a sci-fi theme, which traditionally I don't like, um, this one works fantastically. And it also has this one additional um, mechanism that I really did like where certain tiles would let you move this little kind of space buggy around the map. So you're actually kind of navigating the map with another piece on top of the tiles that you've already built. So really cool, really novel, and just an enjoyable game that definitely did not outstay its welcome, um, good decisions, and just fun. So that was Planet Unknown at number four. At number three, I have Sky Team. Now this was a game that I was not expecting to like at all, because you know nine times out of 10, I don't enjoy uh, co-ops. This one has more of a Euro feel to it, it's not a euro, but it does have kind of dice um, manipulation, dice placement, which, you know, is a mechanism that I enjoy rather than that kind of traditional pandemic co-op system. But this one, you are trying to again, cooperatively fly a plane um, and kind of overcome these hazards, keep your fuel topped up, keep the plane level. And this gets all done through this dice placement system with a, an aspect of limited communication because you cannot discuss what you have in your hand in terms of the dice that you've rolled. So I really do like the fact that you can have a discussion with your opponent saying, or with your teammate, I should say, saying, you know, if you do this, I'll do this. If you roll this, then put it here and I'll counteract it with this and so on. And it's all about trying to spin lots of plates to again safely navigate these threats and land your plane. And again, I like the, the modularity here. Um, I like the little modules you can plug in to add or to increase the complexity or difficulty. You've got different kind of um, scenarios to try and overcome. And it's just super punchy. It's entertaining. It can, you know, sometimes you do have to be prepared to just crash and burn because it's not going to go your way. But I think maybe because my expectations were not high, this one left me really impressed and was way better than I was expecting it to be. So um, definitely a shoe in to be co-op of the year for me. That is Sky Team at number three. At number two, I have The Wandering Towers. Now this is a Kramer and Kiesling, uh, kind of a racing game, but with a few twists. Um, it's basically a kid's game mechanically, but it definitely has enough going on here or has a, a gimmick or two to keep more seasoned gamers entertained because I think some of the concepts here are quite novel and um, are just gonna, are gonna amuse you. So essentially what you're doing is you have a, a set amount of wizards and you are trying to deposit them in this kind of wizard's tower. Um, however, when you play things, you can either move your wizards or you can move these moving towers that they're stood on. And those towers stack on top of each other, almost in like a, a camel up mechanism where you can piggyback and carry things. You can trap other people's pieces um, and carry them maybe inadvertently. Um, it even manages to um, handle the memory aspect of the game well because if your pieces get trapped, you're not allowed to check where they are 
meaning that you might have one piece to get left to get into the tower, but you can't remember where it's been trapped and therefore you have to waste your turns trying to discover it unless you remembered it. So it does have that kind of low stakes memory side of things, which I, I enjoyed. Um, a game that can truly be played and enjoyed by anybody. You can add a few extra things in, in terms of these special abilities. Um, and it's just a really joyous um, experience that um, it has a, a timeless appeal to it. So I think this one could have been released in the 90s and it would probably be like a, a household name. Um, so yeah, I think this one does straddle that line between being a family-friendly children's game, but with a concept or two that's going to entice anybody. So yeah, I really do appreciate that. I think it's done a fantastic job of being so broadly um, appealing. So that is The Wandering Towers at number two. And finally, at number one, and the only game with a definitive chairman's accommodation uh, this episode is Raze. Now, I'd be highly surprised if you guys are aware of this one because it's got very little um, publicity, very little buzz. Um, I can't even remember why this one came onto my radar several years ago. Um, I was waiting for an English copy to come out, but I ended up having to um, buy a, a foreign language copy. But I'm super glad I did because it's all language independent and the rules are super simple. But this is a, a kind of um, commodity speculation, a bluffing and bidding style game where you are trying to collect these point cards by playing cards in your hand. However, these cards in your hand, the value of them or the strength of them is determined by dice rolls. And that's going to multiply with them. So you might have these diamond cards and the diamonds will be as strong um, relating to the dice that are rolled that have diamonds on them. So again, they multiply with each other. So if I had a strength five diamond card and two diamonds down here, that would be a strength 10 card essentially. And what you're doing is that you are using these cards to climb this track. And whoever's furthest behind on this track will be in a position where they have to play their cards. And you're going to keep on playing until you either run out of cards or until you kind of skip or pass and step out of the round. And kind of the last man standing is going to get these points on the points card as well as points on every card that your opponents have used and so many different things come into play here when it comes to bluffing because you might want to start with a really strong card and almost intimidate your opponents into thinking that you have a whole hand of strong cards when in reality you might not do or you might want to start drip feeding your weaker cards enticing your opponents to play more cards and then hit them with the high cards and get the points from their cards as well. So that's pretty much the gist of the game, but it just works really well. Um, again, it's fast, it's it's entertaining, it's fun. Uh, it's got those little nuances. You do have to be prepared that it is built on the foundation of luck because you do not know uh, how strong these cards are gonna be. Uh, you do not know which cards you're gonna draw into your hand, um, but that is somewhat mitigated because you actually get points um, you get points um, corresponding to the cards left in your hand at the end. So an extra decision of do I want to uh, keep these cards in my hand and guarantee myself these points or do I want to use it as a powerful um, playing piece in order to win the actual round and get more points. So all about that gamble. I'm super impressed and um, yeah, I'm quite looking forward to sharing my thoughts on this one in a detailed um, independent review. So I'll be doing that very soon uh, for sure. But definitely... Um, a surprise for sure, um, you know, pleasant surprise, a hidden gem, and uh, that's what I really love about doing this, and that's why I enjoy the hobby, to find those little gems that nobody knows about, and sharing the word, and spreading the word about them. So that is Ray's at number one. So there we have it, that concludes uh, the video. Hopefully you have enjoyed it and found something out here that you wasn't uh, aware of. Um, if you have enjoyed it, please be sure to hit like and subscribe uh, to the channel and check out my other content too. And for everybody else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye-bye.